Let us join and worship God this day. Welcome all on this, the first Sunday after Pentecost, in which we celebrate the holy and divine mystery that is the Trinity on this Trinity Sunday. So I invite you to call yourselves into worship as we use the words printed in the bulletin. We praise you, holy God, for sending your Son to be our Savior. We praise you, holy Jesus, for the promise of sending us a comforter. We praise you, Holy Spirit, for the abundant life that you have in you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for him. Number 138, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
invite you to join with me as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed to affirm that which we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The triune God comes into our lives in many different ways, and all of these ways call us to them. So let us go before whichever person of the Trinity we find ourselves closest to this day as we lay our whole lives on the line and start with confessing where we fall short. Let us join together. Presence, life, fire, God who is three in one, we confess that we have turned away from you. We gaze upon ourselves as if we are worthy of worship. We take your creation into our hands, not to love, but to use and then discard. We go to the people of the land, not to serve, but to press them into our service. We do not deserve that you would even notice us, but we pray for mercy because you are gracious and merciful. Flame of love, purify us from sin. Eternal now, lead us to your truth. Risen one, baptize us into union with you. Transform us into faithful disciples who worship you alone. God, who is the Trinity, Amen. Be assured this day that in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you are forgiven now and each and every day. Amen.
We come to the life and work of the church. If there are any who'd like to lift up things before the congregation, I invite you to stand and do so now. With that, I invite you to look at your bulletin insert to see all that is happening in the life of Mitchell's Presbyterian, all that is coming up. There's no afternoon Bible study this week, so uh, I encourage you all to rest during that time. Uh, we will be starting this Sunday the Summer Social Under the Pavilion. Uh, so when you leave worship today, you have a couple of different options. You can go out and around through the grass. You can go up through the fellowship hall and through the kitchen. You can go all the way through the parking lot. Whichever route you choose to get to the pavilion, I encourage you to go and spend fellowship time under there. I also want to remind everybody that we will be going to the Riverside Theater on June 10th for the dinner and the show. If you would like to carpool, meet here. The bus will leave at 4 p.m. sharp. If you have not paid for those tickets, please do so. Get those to our wonderful treasurer, Ron Evans, over here. He takes cash, card, check, any and all of the above. Make sure you put the church's name on it, though. Blank checks may end up going somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> There are signups in the fellowship hall for uh, Good Timers and the Fred Nats baseball game in August. The Good Timers are headed to Clearwater Fire Grill in Locust Grove on the 22nd of June. I encourage you to do that as well as start marking your calendars for the end of July, our fifth Sunday movie and cookout under the pavilion. Go ahead and start spreading the word. We'd love to have as many in the community come and attend that event that evening. I also want to thank everyone uh, from my own personal standing uh, for the love and support that you have shown both Brittany and I uh, after and before our wedding this past weekend. If you, you know that I talk with my hands a lot, I probably will just sit here spinning this ring for the next couple of Sundays as I get used to uh, the weight that is keeping me in place these days. We've got lots of people to celebrate this day. We have many anniversaries as well as many birthdays. So in the realm of anniversaries, we have Stephen and Laura Groats, Conley and Vicki Wallace, Allison and Kathy Thorpe, Alan and Susan Wallaben, Posey and Betty Ann Howe, and John and Dottie Clatterbuck. We wish all of them this coming week a very happy anniversary and for those who are getting birthdays celebrating another year we have Vic Squire, Crystal Settle, and Vicki Tidman. We wish all of them a very happy birthday this coming week. There's not many changes on the prayer list but I encourage you to keep each and every person on there in your hearts and minds as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Triune God, one of many names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we adore you for your threeness and your oneness, a truly holy mystery. We are in all of that same unfathomable mystery that is reflected in the creation that surrounds us as the flowers bloom and the rain falls as what was a brown field turns to green. May we see you in all that occurs around us. The mystery of the complexity that we find in science of the universe or the atom, of what makes up all that is around us. Let us see you. For the birth of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, let us see you in their eyes. Let us see your love through them and for all of your work in our lives. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, may we see you. Your ways are higher than our ways, your thoughts greater than our thoughts. So, the, so although we acknowledge that we do not understand your ways, we continue to offer you our prayers 
for all of creation and that it may be cared for. As we see those around us who are tenders of gardens and farms, of livestock, of pets, of each other, may we see you. May we pray this day for the nations of the world, for those who are in conflict, for those who find themselves in turmoil. And may we acknowledge the nations who are doing well, who have peace and harmony. And we pray for our nation and its leaders that they may lead the way in which you know, that they may see righteousness and justice, that all may be made in your kingdom's image. And we lift up this community and those who lead it, that they may be guided rightly. And we lift up the church, universal as it works on your behalf, and we lift up this church as we seek to do your will. And we lift up each and every person that is on our prayer list this day. For those who we are thankful for as they recover, for those who are continuously in our prayers, for those who are on the long road to recovery, for those who are just starting their journey in their seeking help, and for those who are celebrating anniversaries and birthdays, and for those who are missing loved ones. We lift up each and every one of these people that are on our hearts and minds. And we pray all of this in the name of the triune God, the three in one, from eternity to eternity, as we pray the prayer that we are taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to lift up your tithes, your offerings, and your very lives this day before the triune God. Ushers. God, we lift up these gifts to you. 
that whichever person comes to claim them may do so in the name of your kingdom, so that we may see them used by the Father, by the Son, or by the Holy Ghost, in your holy name. Amen. I invite you to sing now verses 1 and 2 of him, number 421, Church of Christ in Every Age. Please be seated. Let's pray once more. God, may the teachings of Jesus Christ come and fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit as we hear your word read and proclaimed this day. Amen. Our first scripture lesson comes from the Gospel according to Matthew Chapter 28, verses 16 and 20. Hear these final verses of the Gospel. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but they doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and then of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson comes from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, Chapter 13, verses 11 and 13. Hear Paul's benediction. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Be restored. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Matthew 28 and 2 Corinthians are texts which do indeed hold a holy amount of power when we think about the influence that they have had not only on Christian communities, both modern and ancient, and every age in between, but they are powerful because they give direction. They give vaguely explicit directions that are given, but also are given in a way in which are invoking the Trinity. They invoke the most holy mystery in our faith, one that is often a struggle to explain. Therefore, to speak on both of these scriptures from the pulpit in a way that seeks to explain 
what the triune God wants from us can be powerful and it can be dangerous. The pulpit can indeed be a dangerous place, a place where some damaging things can be said in the name of each person of the Trinity. And I say all of these things because attempting to tell each of you what God is, three in one, one in three, and what our triune God desires of each of you is a task that will never be complete. And I will be wrong. Because we as humans with our finite brains are literally unable to comprehend God and figure out what, who, and how the Trinity exists as itself. There's been many attempts throughout the ages to explain the Trinity, and one of my favorite ways of looking at it is a video called St. Patrick's Bad Analogies. I'm not going to try and do any of the Scottish accents of this video, but I am going to tell you of the bad analogies. You see, first, you can explain the Trinity like water. Because water comes in three forms, liquid, ice as a solid, and vapor. However, this is heretical. It's called modalism. Modalism is the belief that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three different modes of God, as opposed to the Trinitarian view of three distinct persons within the Godhead. You can also explain the Trinity in one attempt as the Son. Because you have the sun, the heat, and the light. Three parts of the same thing. Yet this is also heretical. Arianism. The position that God created both Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and therefore they are subordinate under the leadership of God. Just as light and heat are not the sun, but products of the sun. Now, I was going to lift up this three-leaf clover, but one of its leaves fell off. So I'm just going to talk about the apple. The apple, you see, is made up of three parts, the skin, the flesh, and the seeds. Also, one of the things in the video that they liken this to is Voltron, where many lion robots come together to form one giant samurai robot. This is partialism. It teaches that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make up only one-third of God, rather than having each being holy themselves and holy each other. I illustrate these bad analogies because there is no way to explain what fully encompasses the greatness and mystery of who the triune God is. You can look at your bulletin insert to try and see something a little more clear but still just as confusing. confusing. And so I issue these warnings of a dangerous pulpit and show you all of the bad analogies of the Trinity because the verses that we read today can be twisted. And they have been heavily twisted. The Great Commission has been used in support of mass murder and forced conversions, the crusade and radical exclusions of people from the church as they are deemed unworthy to be disciples or followers of Christ. Matthew 28 has also been a calling card to teach certain or select teachings from the Bible as it calls us to teach all about what Christ shows us as a way to live in the world. Things aren't taught. Things are taught that aren't from Jesus. Or sometimes things that aren't even from the Bible are taught. How often have we drawn a picture of Jonah being swallowed by a whale? It wasn't a whale. Biblically, it was a fish. Or that Scripture tells us that cleanliness is next to godliness. Not in the Bible. It comes from a sermon, from a pulpit, from John Wesley. And maybe you've told someone, as I have, that this too shall pass. A phrase not from the Bible. It's actually a misquote of the scriptural phrase that has come to pass during an interview by fired Brown or Bears head coach Mike Dicka. That is where that phrase comes from. This is why we are called in Matthew 28 to educate, 
to do it with what Christ actually shows us and tells us to do, to feed and house those who are hungry and without homes, to make peace and not rage war, to be merciful and righteous. Growing up and even into college, these were not often what I heard in church. And it makes me wonder, is that what is being taught to those who are new to Christianity? Are those whom are seeking to become Christians being taught rightly, or are they being brought in, baptized, sprinkled, or dunked and forgotten about based on the only following the first part of the Great Commission? To baptize to all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and forgetting the final verse, the teaching verse. I wonder if that was part of the issue to the church in Corinth. Did Paul's leaving open the door for people to stop teaching the message of Christ, the one who upended the normal ways of the world with radical love and acceptance, and they moved to a teaching to bring more in. And maybe they will learn which gospel. They led, this all led to them having issues that needed this third letter from Paul as he continued to be told of the fighting and the division of, amongst the congregation. You see, we know that Paul needed to address these issues. We see them in the first letter, or at least what we call the first letter. And the letter titled 2 Corinthians must also address the same continuous issues of this community. The one we read today, all of 2 Corinthians, is much less refined than first. You see, we think that Paul wrote this on the go, that he had spurts of divine influence as he was traveling around. It shows Paul's emotions as he struggles and is frustrated with the church that he loves. But the Corinthian church is one that looks very much like the modern church. It's full of division in a very small world where a melting pot of thoughts and people and opinions are shared quickly. Paul's writing shows us that members were at each other's throats as some claimed to be spiritually superior over one another. And they tried to establish themselves apart from each other via ecstatic acts during worship service. These in-church divisions eroded relationships within the community and spilled out into the outside world where some would even take each other to court over what we're not quite sure. But their attitudes poisoned everything from their worship service to their community dinners with bad behaviors and even worse manners. One writer points out that Paul addresses this community as the saints who are in Corinth. It makes you wonder what the Corinthian sinners looked like. You see, Corinth was a capital city in the ancient world and was one of the largest and most prosperous of its time. The city found itself on a narrow strip of land between the Adriatic Sea and the Aegean Sea. And so the Corinthians, instead of being able to dig a canal, established ports on either side of the city. The Corinthians did this and people would could offload their cargo from their ship and the crew and they would take it all nine miles to the next port and they'd load up another ship and the crew would get on and they'd continue on their journey. It was such an easy route that even some of the smaller ships were lifted from the water in one port and carried to the next. Now today this road has been replaced by a canal through which large cargo ships passed, but this vital trade route made Corinth a place of wealth and status. It's where the entrepreneurs went to create their business, and it was also a port town, a double port town to be precise, and that meant your stereotypical rough and tough sailors, along with the many different ethnicities and languages of travels, travelers and the many many different people with lots of different reasons for being in town. Now this 
mix of people was reflected in the Corinthian church. We know that most were poor and without status, and we, but we also know that some were wealthy and influential. It's not much different today. The modern day Christian church is just as diverse and all who are coming in and out of the doors of the church do so with their own reasons for being here. So Paul writes. He writes to them and writes to us in an appeal that the, they have agreements, that they erase divisions, and that peace may reign within the church. He wants the folks to be of like mind. But this is not for the sake of erasing individuality because Paul has already applauded the church for their vast diversity and uniqueness. Instead, the apostle is seeking to inspire us to think, each of us together as a holy community of Christ, to think according to the way of Christ Jesus. That we may be of the same mind as Christ, the one who humbled himself for the sake of the world and promised each of us the comforter as he led us in the ways of God's kingdom. This is so that we may have the kind of love for one another that will grant peace and healing amongst the children of God. Because it's not about checking the boxes of conversion and baptism so that we get our rubber stamp to get into heaven. No, Paul is not saying that if the members of the church usher in peace and mercy, then God of peace and love will be with you. No, the, the text and throughout the Bible in Matthew 28 and in our 2 Corinthians tells us that God's love and peace, the presence of God is already and always will be with each and every one of us. I am with you always to the end of the age. God of love and peace will be with you. Paul encourages the members and reminds them all that God will be there throughout the whole process. This is the way of being, a way that Paul and those in the church are meant to teach and to reteach over and over again by the instruction of the triune God. Paul tells the church to rejoice in the joy and the peace, the mercy and love of God and each other. Paul's message is to look for ways of healing and wholeness, not twist what Jesus has shared for the benefit of one group or another in an attempt to grab power. Not to stir up support for one person or group or oppose the benefiting the whole as Christ calls us to do. We are called today not only to do what the Great Commission calls us to do, to go out and make disciples of all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But also that we teach people the truth about what Jesus taught. The greatest is these. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is what we are commanded to do. I have commanded you, says Jesus. This is what the commandment is. This is what we are told to obey. This is what we are told to go out preaching and teaching as we go to all nations. So I encourage you not to twist a simple message. We need to teach the message, the one that is in the Scripture, the one of love. To teach, we must learn. And to learn, we must be taught. And the cycle goes on and on. Corinth was full of many different people, and they all needed to learn from each other. And so must we. So go out teaching and reteaching. Remind each other that there is nothing that we must earn. There is nothing that we should be competing for, and we are never separated from any person of the triune God. Therefore, as Paul says, remind each other and remember for yourself that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with, is with, and shall be with all of you. Amen. There is no barrier to any person of the triune God. We do not have anything in this world or beyond that is capable of keeping us separate from our triune God. We have that opportunity to join this day at the table to come before God in whichever person we find comfort in to sit and eat. For this table is not Mitchell's table. It's not a Presbyterian table. It's not even a worldly table. This is Christ's table in which all are welcome. There is plenty of seats and plenty of food. So let us come and eat this day. Let us pray. Holy, holy God, Blessed three in one, you created the cosmos and called it good. Your word became flesh and gave us new light. You made us a church by the power of your spirit and you sustain us still. You call us to righteousness and challenge us with your justice and you overwhelm us with your love. Bless now these gifts of bread and wine fruits of your creation, that the body and blood of Christ, our communion with you and with one another, can form our wills to your will. Open our minds and enlarge our hearts, renew our hope, and strengthen us in faith until we feast together at your table in glory, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God forever and ever. Amen. Elders. On Christ's final night on earth, He gathered at the Passover table with friends, all of them enjoying a meal. And in the midst of the meal, he took the bread and he held it up and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat of this, you do so in remembrance of me. And as the meal came to an end, he would take the cup and he poured it out saying this is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you and for the forgiveness of many every time you drink of this do so in remembrance of me so now we eat this bread and drink of this cup as we proclaim the risen Savior Jesus Christ in the faith and knowledge that he shall come again let us join let us eat let us remember
the body of Christ broken for you. cup of salvation shed for you. Let us pray. Holy God, three and one, one and three, a mystery never to be known. Make yourself known to us through this meal as we have been nourished by your bread and your cup that it may teach and re-teach us each and every day that you are calling us to go out to all nations, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to teach all that Christ taught and commanded us. We do this this day in your triune name. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for him, number 229, from all that dwell below the skies.
Friends, you have heard the commission this day. But you have heard all of the commission. So go out teaching and reteaching and hear these words from the Apostle Paul as you leave. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.